good evening warm greetings and welcome to chennai center for china studies national maritime foundation institutional dialogue on the topic india russia partnership and the chinese factor influences impact and imperatives the year 2020 saw several geopolitical happenings that impacted both india and russia for instance the sharpening rivalry between the us and china the china's aggression at india's border the continuing decline in ties between the west and russia and now change of leadership in the us though india and russia share a long history of strategic and economic cooperation the post cold war russia china strategic convergence is seen to be a foreign policy challenge for india mapping these developments mr nandan unikrishnan distinguished fellow and head of eurasian studies program at observer research foundation new delhi will offer perspectives on india russia ties in light of the china factor and what the road ahead looks like this dialogue will be steered and moderated by ambassador yam ganapati former secretary west ministry of external affairs government of india and distinguished member c3s who will offer his reflections on the emerging complexities for india's foreign policy in light of russia china convergence on this note i would like to hand it over to my director commodore rs vasan indian navy retired director c3s and regional director national maritime foundation for his introductory remarks over to you sir uh, thank you bala uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen i'd like to uh, you know acknowledge the presence of many of my naval colleagues who are here and it's a great pleasure to host this event and uh, c3s has been doing this for nearly 15 months now and as ambassador ganapati brought out uh, you know we've been able to optimize on our efforts in terms of getting the best in the trade and uh, uh nandan it was a particular pleasure for me to see you today because i joined my think tank uh, carrier with orf very presently located and that was 16 years ago so i was with orf for three years and we have had many interactions at that time and here in dambasada ganapati uh, you know i don't think uh, there's anybody else who can beat this kind of a combination because both of them are served in russia and uh, not only have they served in russia they are in the same building so there is a phenomenal amount of synergy in terms of what they going to bring to the table today uh, so <clears throat> you know as bala has rightly brought out uh, the the whole uh, uh, geopolitical geo strategic geo economic uh, contours are changing and uh, russia has been very special to us uh, you know not just uh, now but for uh, decades and uh, i myself was in uh, then soviet union for training like many of our naval officers are and uh, you know they have been steadfast in supporting india's aspirations not just as soviet union but also after the breakup when russia has been constantly with us there is no way we could have won the 1971 war without uh, uh, the india soviet union friendship treaty of 1971 and thereafter the amount of efforts that have gone in in terms of the energy you know the nuclear energy right here where i am sitting not less than uh, about 100 kilometers from here we have kudamkulam and there are more of these which are coming in the next 20 years which will add to our uh, uh, you know uh, efforts on green energy so uh, russia is uh, definitely a very very important strategic partner for us uh, china obviously would be very happy if there is some discord that is there and it would like to play up on those whenever it happens quad is one issue i am sure nandan will talk about it and namba sagnapati will also talk about it but the fact is that while uh, uh, so with the soviet union held our hand uh, in various uh, issues uh, it's now the entire changes that are uh, sweeping the world and this morning i think all of you saw the report where uh, russia and china are again joining hands uh, for uh, generating nuclear energy and within india you know there are many all the navy air force officers here in the group and uh, we know that uh, more than 70% of what we import from russia uh, is is something that holds uh, us in good stead 1971 in fact the missiles which were brought into the field for the very first time were of russian origin you know which are fired from our missile force so we can uh, speak for hours on all this but today the topic is more related to what are the inferences what are the imperatives for india and uh, you know what are the conclusions that we can draw in a changing uh, world which is there because there are many commonalities you know on one hand we are part of the, the china russia india block were for discussions and on another hand we have the japan uh, america and india so on one hand you can cry with cri and or you can say jai with jai 
So, you know, uh, these, these are some of the equations that are emerging and each of that has an important role to play in stabilizing relations and in helping us in uh, uh, carving out a trajectory that would hold us uh, well into the 21st century. So it's not my speech. Uh, it is all about uh, Nandan and Ambassada Ganapati uh, taking the floor from now on. And uh, uh, between the two of them, I have, I'm sure we have a wonderful uh, uh, show that will unfold in front of us in the next hour and a half. Uh, Bala will, of course, tell you in the, uh, in the chat box that all the questions can only be posed in the chat box. This is in the interest of time. And uh, Bala will ensure that uh, they are either put together or they are addressed individually at the end of the session. So uh, as and when the questions occur, you can go ahead and uh, put them in the chat box and they'll all be handled uh, later at the end of the talk. Uh, with that, uh, may I now request uh, Ambassador Ganapati, the chair and moderator, to take over and conduct the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commodore Basan. Uh, is the voice coming loud and clear? Perfect, sir. Yeah, because uh, I see that my computer sometimes says that the internet is unstable, I think because of the heavy rain. So I just thought I'll double check. Well, this is a very interesting uh, subject, uh, as Commodore Vasan and Bala mentioned. Uh, and of course, C3S has brought this subject for discussion today. Because to, in today's world, I think there's a lot of importance given in the media to what is happening in the West, particularly the USA, and USA's relations with China, Russia, and of course, Europe. Not much has been talked of India-Russia relations, or Sino-Indian relations, or even the third element in the triangle, which is the Russia-China equation. Of course, when you talk of India-Russia relations, our relations go back well before our independence. In fact, uh, if you had read glimpses of world, world history by our first prime minister, there's a reference to the Soviet Union. Even before that, Mahatma Gandhi was influenced by Leo Tolstoy. So obviously, there's been a lot of empathy and high level of interaction and interest from India towards the Soviet Union and vice versa. After independence, of course, uh, the Soviet Union was unsure of India's role in the world. And it took a little while for relations to be established and developed with the first visit by Khrushchev and Bulganin in 1955. And of course, thereafter, during the 62 war, we found uh, the Soviets more or less on our side, which was one of the reasons for the Sino-Soviet split thereafter. In 1971, of course, was the highest point in the Indo-Soviet equation when we signed the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation and the Article 9 there too. When the Soviet Union broke up, or when the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991, December, there was a lot of confusion in the minds of many a thinker whether relations would continue to be as it were before the breakup, or whether we'll find new elements of convergence in a diverging world. I think immediately after the breakup, uh, one of the main concerns was the presence of uh, Nandan would, uh, of course, uh, know uh, the Soviet foreign, uh, the Russian foreign minister Kozirev was totally pro West, and uh, that itself in our embassy in uh, Voronzo Pole, we were wondering where it will be. But the 93 visit by President Yeltsin restored a sense of even keel in our relationship. In the Soviet treaty, treaty without but a rework of friendship. Ambassador, I think there is uh, some issue with your audio. After the break, there was a lot of concern whether our relationship will but, but in the dynamic. Oh, is it okay? Are you able to hear me? Uh, it cuts off in between. And now it's coming to it. Right now it is good, but in between it's cutting off. Okay. 
okay if it cuts off i don't know maybe i no, as i said if there's a problem switch off your video mm -hmm. it may work better with the audio is that better now much better okay let's let's hope <laughs> i think uh, no as i was saying so importantly the besides the political part we were also equally concerned as to where our cooperation and so nuclear and space areas go, go. but when you look at the, the yeltsin visit as i said of 93 and the first what we called as a joint commission was termed as the india russia intergovernation it was one of the most comprehensive areas of interaction between countries which india with which india had an institutionalized mechanism and this reassured many of us that the relationship would not only be restored to pre breakup levels but would be taken to further greater heights of course there was always the confusion with uh, president gelson as to where what will bring what will tomorrow bring but that problem was not to be then of course on the uh, in the 99 uh, in 99 we had uh, president putin instantly uh, president putin transited through delhi airport in 1999 october when he was prime minister uh, when he was transiting from new zealand to russia and that was the first high level interaction we had at the uh, indira gandhi airport and we were able to not only take the measure of where our relation should go and president putin himself was able to understand the nitty gritty of india russia relations of course that was a long time ago and since then i think uh, we much water has as they say flown under the brahmaputra and the muskova river and in today's world where do indo russian relations stand i think uh, a lot of people and particularly in the media were painting a very grim picture of the direction of indo russian relations uh, as to whether the third uh, element of the the third angle of the, the third line of the triangle which was china russia relations how would they sort of measure up and how would they impact on india russia relations yes after the developments vis-a-vis -vis development in the relations between russia and the west russia started moving close to the people's republic of china which was seen as a natural corollary and which was of course welcomed with open hands by the chinese and if you take today's relationship between russia and china is as they call it it's one of the most comprehensive is what president putin and foreign minister lavrov have termed it to be and this year would be the 20th anniversary in july of the signing of the treaty of good neighborliness neighborliness friendship and cooperation between russia and china and uh, as foreign minister lavrov mentioned in gelen when he visited there in march it is going to be not only a cause for celebration but would also bring in new elements into the cooperation from july until february 2022 when the which will be the 20th anniversary of the ratification of the treaty uh, comrade vasan of course mentioned the nuclear cooperation this was the uh, commissioning of the 7th and 8th units of the tianwan nuclear power plant and the third and fourth units of the zhudapu power plant in china where both president putin and president xi jinping uh, talked to each other it it was a virtual uh, inauguration of these uh, power plant units the question which also comes to which has been talked of is are the russians and the chinese going towards a military alliance uh, of course uh, you have uh, uh, talked uh, this has been reflected in the media a lot but we should uh, i think president putin himself had said that that is technically not necessary because the element of cooperation which they have could point in that direction but there's no not going to be any formalization of such an uh, such a thing and so has minister lavrov mentioned that there will be no military alliance but the cooperation is very vast and extensive but 
at the same time of course that has not uh, reassured many in the in the analytical circles but in south block at least i could say that in the ministry of external affairs i think we take russia russian leaders at their word of course uh, in this context one of the things which happened was the discussion between prime minister modi and uh, president putin over the uh, on a virtual platform just a couple of days ago and what is very interesting is uh, the announcement of a 2 plus 2 dialogue i think one interesting element i should mention here is while in our uh, press release we mentioned of the 2 plus 2 dialogue the kremlin press release did not talk of it the kremlin press release was a very anodyne statement talking of only the uh, the pandemic they did not even reflect on gaganyan there was nothing just the pandemic and that we assure full cooperation that russia is ready to send so and so aid and all that so again does the anodyne statement there reflect the extensive and warm statement which came out of south block i would think uh, yes i think uh, the warm statement was a sort of a reassuring element because again if you look at what the media had mentioned and what many analysts had pointed out was the postponement of the india russia summit you know in uh, 2001 if you all recall in october 2001 when president putin made his first visit to uh, to india when i think at that time i was a joint secretary of europe so had a personal hand in the conduct of the visit we agreed that there would be an annual summit uh, between india and russia and the annual summit had continued in an unbroken fashion till last year of course the main reason was the pandemic and a summit of that nature between uh, india and russia can never be conducted at the virtual mode because uh, as had been mentioned by one of the distinguished ambassadors of india to the russian federation ambassador ps raghavan i think before the plenary level discussions most of the classified elements of interaction are discussed between the two leaders one on one with perhaps one aid only or one aid an interpreter and no one no one else so obviously a virtual platform was a no go and if everything goes well uh, i think we would have the summit this year so i think as mentioned by many others i don't see that as a slip back or a major area of concern the summit will take place this year and the summit will discuss all elements of cooperation of course uh, uh, i'll just take one or two minutes before i uh, hand the hand the floor to nandan the other element of uh, concern which was aired in the media was uh, foreign minister lavrov's uh, uh, heavy handed criticism if i could put it that way of the indo pacific uh, uh, concept uh, of course uh, between what uh, foreign minister lavrov mentioned in Uh, in hanoi sometime last year what he mentioned uh, before coming here what he told some chinese newspaper editors before he went to guilin and also what was discussed at uh, the russian uh, tv one uh, great game balshaya igra program was all set at rest when he came here and we when he spoke to uh, the hindustan times editor before coming to india i think what he said is that we have a perfect understanding of each other's position and we respect the right i mean on the arms the second element was on the arms cooperation i think we respect the right for each country to diversify its sources so obviously i think that should have also set many of the concerns at ease of course one element of discord was for the first time we had a russian foreign minister visiting pakistan from new delhi uh, of course uh, that was uh, but uh, and the last point before i hand over is was uh, prime minister modi not meeting lavrov a correct decision well there are many elements in what happens in diplomacy and i think this is all taken on uh, in your stride and moves on and the last discussion which i think Uh, despite the anodyne statement of the kremlin uh, i think the kremlin always puts out its statement in a very 
it, it, it's not very evocative or uh, as we do. Uh, and uh, the very warm statement from uh, uh, from Lok Kalyan Mag, I think the relationship, I would, for me at least, it is an even deal. And we look forward to further consolidation of these relations. Of course, before we have our summit, there would be the summit between uh, Presidents Putin and Xi Jinping. And we would have, uh, uh, I mean, we would have, uh, we would be witness to see what sort of elements are there. Uh, and we would also, perhaps before we have our summit, we would have some more uh, discussions on the SEO platform and also the BRICS, uh, where India is the host. And also, I think uh, the Prime Minister and the President of Russia would have met at the G20 and other summits. There's a very interesting comment which uh, had come up uh, by one of the Russian, uh, oh, no, I think one, it was one of the Chinese uh, uh, think tanks uh, which had put out in terms of the US, Russia, China statements. I think he had said that the, China would be happy to see the trilateral relationship between the three countries like a scaling triangle, where the shortest distance would be between Russia and the USA. The second shortest, the second distance would be between the USA and China. And the longest distance would be between uh, uh, between Russia. Sorry, the distance in distance terms, the shortest distance between Russia and China, the second longest between USA and China, and the longest between Russia and the USA. I think the Chinese uh, analysts, perhaps in the long run, may be disappointed with the Biden administration waiving the Nord Stream two uh, project to move ahead. And uh, we'll have to see how things go. But would that have an element of uh, wishful thinking on the Chinese side? Maybe we we'll, can discuss this after Nandan's presentation and QA. I think with these opening words, I think may I now pass on the floor to Nandan. Bala, you can move on the mic on to Nandan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Nandan, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh... <clears throat> Thank you for the warm and kind words. Let me start by uh, acknowledging and thanking the Chennai Center for Chinese Studies for this uh, opportunity to uh, speak before such a learned and distinguished audience. Many here, I'm sure, are people who probably know more about the subject than I'm going to speak to. So I personally see this as an opportunity to learn. Uh, once again, thank you, Commodore Wasson. And of course, I cannot but acknowledge uh, that I'm honored by the fact that Ambassador Ganapati has agreed to chair this session. There are a couple of caveats I would like to start with. The first is, of course, one should recognize that I'm not a China expert. So uh, I'm not a specialist in China. But my understanding of uh, China-Russia relations is formed in terms of the Chinese perspective, is formed primarily, there are very few, unfortunately, Chinese writings in English on this subject. But I have uh, interacted quite a lot with Chinese scholars who work on Russia. So uh, that is what my personal interactions have given me some insights into the way they look at it. And But my talk as such will be preponderantly driven by the Russia perspective on Russia-China relations. I will start uh, by speaking on uh, Russia-China relations. And then towards the end, now that Ambassador Ganapati has spoken so eloquently about India-Russia relations, I may devote a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes, on the India-Russia aspect and how it plays with the Russia-China relationship. I also would like to say that normally Russia-China relations, as Commodore Wasson said, could take hours of discussion to bring out all the nuances. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, I, I describe it as a relationship that can be spoken about in five minutes or in many hours. So squeezing it into 20 minutes is essentially going to be stretching five minutes to 20. So if there is repetition, please forgive me. OK, here we go. Uh, 
Russia China relations are today probably amongst uh, are at a best standing since the 1950s. Uh, the relationship has primarily grown in the past two decades, uh, uh, ever since uh, it was declared uh, a strategic partnership in 1996. Uh, it was initially driven uh, to growth. I mean, the growth was initially driven by the fact that both countries felt humiliated by the West, or rather by the US-led West, because the primary humiliation was heaped upon them from their perspective by the United States. For Russia, it was the triumphalist air that uh, the United States and the West displayed when uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, despite efforts at that time, again referred to uh, by Ambassador Ganapati, when Russia wanted to integrate itself with the West, they were not willing to see an equal partnership, and the Russians felt that they were not even being offered the role of a junior partner, but they were being asked to be just a subservient partner in the Western alliance, something that the, uh, uh, the Russian psyche, which is a very proud psyche, was finding difficult to digest. In China's case, it was a humiliation of a slightly different kind. Uh, incidentally, about the Russian case of humiliation, I would advise, if anyone is interested deeper in this subject, to read the book by Strobe Talbot, who was uh, President Clinton's points person on China. He's written a book called Russia Hand, which describes his time in uh, uh, the State Department and how he uh, dealt with Russia, including their discussions with uh, President Yeltsin, and one discussion with President Putin. But anyhow, coming back to China, China's humiliation was what happened in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 96 or 95. I don't remember the exact date. When uh, China, if you remember, fired a few missiles at the Taiwanese, trying to influence their internal political developments, because they felt that Taiwan was trying to declare openly its uh, moving away from the one China policy. Uh, and then, of course, the US display of might uh, with its Navy moving in several ships, President Clinton deployed. And uh, the Ch Chinese felt uh, important at that point in front of this uh, awesome display of power. And this was a public humiliation in their mind because their importance was put forth uh, in front of everyone. So that acted as the glue. And so in 2001, as again, Ambassador Ganapati has referred to, you have the uh, treaty signed between Russia and China. And the relationship really starts developing very rapidly. Uh, there is a further impetus to the relationship, given by the fact that uh, Russia's relations with the West begin to deteriorate towards the end of the first decade of this century, uh, which is exemplified by the Georgia crisis, the conflict over Georgia. But the breaking point really is uh, arrived at, I would think, in 2014 with the Ukraine crisis. And it's really exacerbated beyond the point of return with the 2016 allegations of uh, interference in the US election. Uh, it is natural that after the loss of uh, com Western cooperation, particularly after sanctions were imposed post-Ukraine, as well as post uh, the 2016 elections, uh, that Russia started uh, pushing for a closer relationship with China. As uh, one Russian scholar, Mr. Gabuyev, has put it, it was hoped that China would become a major buyer of Siberian hydrocarbons. Shanghai and Hong Kong would become the new London and New York for Russian companies seeking capital. And Chinese investors would flock to buy Russian assets, providing badly needed cash uh, to improve the country's aging infrastructure. And there would be also sharing of technology. We will look at it briefly later, whether this has come true or not. Uh, but uh, 
while these were the aspirations the Russians had, the Chinese response initially was very careful. Uh, they did uh, keep quiet when Crimea and Ukraine happened. They did not condemn uh, the Russians, but neither and did not join the international uh, efforts to sanction the Russians, the US led effort. But at the same time, they did not speak uh, in support of the Russians. Uh, they basically stayed quiet, neutral, if you want. They still valued their relationship with the US far greater than uh, their, uh, they saw any benefits out of developing a deep relationship with Russia. But this changes in 2018. And in 2018, you see that uh, the Chinese realize that the US uh, is not going to uh, shift its focus, that it sees uh, the Chinese as its main adversary, and it will not be deterred in any fashion from dealing with the problem. So therefore, the Chinese were looking for a stronger partner, for a stronger uh, ally uh, to balance, as it were, the situation and to withstand US pressure. And uh, to put it in common parlance, Russia appeared to be what the good doctor had ordered. So from 2018 onwards, you find that there is a tremendous synergy uh, increase in terms of uh, the relationship between uh, China and Russia. And today it's led to a situation where uh, both of them see it as beneficial, the need to upgrade their ties continuously. And some people even consider it that uh, they may be a de jure, if not de facto, in an alliance. But before I come to uh, discussing that, I just want to underline what kind of base this relationship today has. In the economic sphere, I mean, to if you take the uh, uh, Russia-China relationship, you will see that the relationship has moved since 2009 uh, very rapidly forward. In 2009, China became the top trading partner of Russia, but trade was somewhere around $60 uh, billion. Today, the trade has crossed $100 billion and uh, accounts for almost 15% of Russia's exports and imports. So you can see the significance that the relationship with China is playing uh, for is for Russia, particularly since this has increased uh, after the crisis in Ukraine. Of course, the most uh, intensive area where uh, this relationship has improved has been hydrocarbons. And uh, to symbolize the fact that this relationship is developing, uh, you know, the, 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 the country shares, the two countries share a very long border and a large substantial part of it, the border is the Amur River over which in fact they had the dispute way back in 67 and then the 70s. Today, for the first time after centuries, you have two bridges that span that river. You know, despite being close to each other for many centuries, these two countries never built a land bridge to span the river. And that has just happened recently. So that is, to me, uh, indication, even if symbolic, of how important uh, the two countries consider their economic ties. Uh, the turn, I mean, one is economics. The second is there is a turn of, away from the United States by Russia in the financial sense also. Russia has reduced its dependence on the dollar substantially. It now uh, holds more of its uh, debt and assets in uh, euros and in yuan. Uh, it's uh, the central banks, for example, holdings of Chinese currency has gone up from 2.6% to 14% in the last uh, few years. So that is another uh, indication. Uh, however, let me also point out that this relationship is not as simple as it seems on the surface. 
On the surface, of course, as I was pointing out, it seems everything is hunky-dory and they are moving a great speed uh, forward in the economic realm. But uh, not all aspirations of the Russians are being met in this relationship. One of the problems they are facing is that Chinese investments are not flowing the way the Russians originally anticipated. Part of it is, of course, a Russian problem in the sense that the Chinese, like any other country or like any other business, Chinese business people are wary about putting their money into Russia because there are risks. It's an opaque system and the returns are probably not commensurate with those risks. But uh, they do invest in natural resources and all. Uh, however, I think also part of the reason for lack of uh, investment from China is given the engagement that China has with the US economy, given the amount of engagement that Chinese banks have with the US financial system, I think they are genuinely worried about US applying sanctions on these banks and on their transactions. So that is another sort of break on China's uh, delivering on the uh, investment front. But on the other hand, there is also an aspect of the Russians. The Russians are not too keen on developing their dependency on uh, China. So Russia has put, because they don't want an economic uh, dependency that will imperil their political independence. And so if you can see, the Russians have a few uh, checks, if you want, or limits. Uh, in their relationship in integrating with the Chinese economy. Uh, for example, A, they do not sell genuine strategic assets to China. China wants to buy ports. China is keen to uh, 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 buy certain other strategic assets, but the Russians are not allowing uh, the Chinese to get into those areas. Uh, the second point is, that the Russians are very careful about not incurring a debt to the Chinese. So they are not taking loans from China. You know, they are willing to, happy to get into joint ventures and all, but they are not going out for outright loans. Uh, and if you notice again, where, while they are cooperating on a variety of projects, Russia has not endorsed the BRI directly. Russia has endorsed the BRI through the Eurasian Economic Union. They have joined with the Eurasian Economic Union to cooperate with uh, the Silk Route. But Russia, although Russia benefits, there is part of some uh, uh, highways and a railway which goes through Russia, but it is all through the Eurasian Economic Union. So as I said, the re reality of their economic relationship has a dual uh, kind of a facade. One is, of course, on the surface, everything appears hunky-dory, but below the surface, uh, there are certain amount of tensions. The second uh, area of concern for India would be uh, Russia's military access, Russia-China military access. And this military access is of late uh, primarily driven by A, arms sales. Russia has started selling arms to China, which it never sold before be holding off extensive military exercises. And very recently, there have been indications that Russia and China are also possibly uh, collaborating on some uh, joint ventures in the military arena. To start with, I mean, was the decision of the Russians to sell S-400 and uh, uh, the Su-35 fighter jets to uh, China. Now, prior to that, Russia always sold to Russia, to China, uh, equipment that was uh, one level lower than what it sold to us. So with the sale of this, these two elements, that uh, self-imposed kind of uh, limit was breached. And uh, Russia has moved to providing uh, the latest technology that it puts out for uh, exports to China also. 
the other thing which would of course concern india again is that uh, president putin uh, at the valdai uh, conference in 2019 and i was present so i can't say that this is misreported by the press said that russia is assisting china in developing a missile early, early uh, missile attack early warning system now as we know only the usa and russia currently possess such strategic deterrence capabilities so russia uh, helping china develop it although it's clearly meant to enhance uh, china's uh, effectiveness vis-a-vis -vis the usa but it is obviously something that would be of concern to us and uh, at another level of course we have the exercises that they conduct uh now the military exercises in uh russia that the military exercise center in which uh, there were 3200 troops and uh, some 30 aircraft from china that participated uh this uh, there, there are two angles to this one is undoubtedly it reflects a uh, uh closeness but it is also true that the russians uh, were left with i mean i think uh, were also concerned that a exercise of that magnitude uh, conducted in uh, <coughs> close to the borders with uh, china if the chinese were not invited would create apprehensions within china as to the purpose of that exercise so therefore i think partly the chinese participation was to blunt any misapprehensions that could arise the other significant uh, elements are of course for the first time russia conducted a joint air patrol over the sea of japan in east asia the second is that uh, they conducted uh, naval exercises off the coast of southern africa as well as in the persian gulf with china they have done it in the mediterranean the baltic sea and the black sea now this is clearly a reflection of china asserting its ability or wanting to assert its ability about its capability to project power globally uh it is of course also important to note that uh, where the areas that russia is collaborating with in the military arena uh with uh, china they are areas where uh they do not feel that the chinese can use that weaponry against them they feel that there is sufficient confidence they feel that this is something that is uh going to be used against the united states or defensively by china vis-a-vis -vis the united states uh now we come to the question as to given this kind of developments can we really say that uh, russia and china what is the scene between them what is it is it a, a a genuine alliance or what is the kind of relationship that would be uh, what is the what are the words that would be best describe this uh, dmitry trenian uh, who is a very well known uh, political analyst international affairs expert in russia describes the relationship as an entente cordiale uh, which is like the anglo french um, relationship prior to cold war about uh, world war 1 which allowed the alliance to fight germany together essentially it boils down in my simplified view uh, to three elements russia and china will be close to each other as long as they perceive a common threat from the united states as long as they feel uh, firstly that is one second is both of these are autocratic uh, states and they will feel challenged by any efforts at regime change by the united states so there will be growing collaboration and the third element is something which i normally don't consider uh, most important in international affairs but here it is becoming important is the personal chemistry between uh, xi jinping and uh, vladimir putin they seem to have a very very close and uh, mm, i don't know if it's honest frank but they have a close relationship 
They talk to each other often, and uh, they seem to have developed an element of trust and comfort with each other. Uh, so, do I believe now? Just final before I go into India, Russia. Do I believe that uh, Russia and China are in an alliance? I don't think so. I and this is my opinion. I don't think so because Russia understands that in an alliance with anybody, uh, equal partnerships are very very difficult. So there is always a senior or a junior partner. So far, that is what history has taught us. Except uh, you know this Antant Cordial uh, kind of relationship, but otherwise formal alliances always have a senior partner and russia is loath to accept anyone as a senior partner it walked out of the partnership with the west to which it is far more akin and has far more uh, affinity it walked out of the partnership the west because it did not want to be a junior partner i cannot imagine the russian pride accepting being a junior partner to any other power so in that sense i don't think that today the relationship between uh, Russia and uh, China is one of an alliance. But on the other hand, I do see that the precursor elements for this relationship to be deeper are growing because of Western pressure on both countries. You know, and they, because of the long border, the share of their complementarities economically and militarily, they will see the value in maintaining a close partnership. And for example, I mean, to put it very simply, that if the Russians have an engagement with the Western powers in, uh, on its Western borders, it can be confident that nothing is going to happen on its Southern borders. The Chinese are not going to move against it or play games with them on that. And similarly, the Chinese today have the confidence that if they have an engagement with a hostile engagement with uh, the Americans or its allies on its eastern shores, the Russians are not going to enter into any kind of games with it on the northern border. Historically, if you remember, China was always worried about invasions from the north. That's why you have the Great Wall of China. So uh, this is where my position is on the, the Russia-China relationship. How does this relationship impact the India-Russia relationship? You know, Ambassador Ganapati has given you a history. He's told you how in times of crisis, including vis-a-vis -vis China, the Russians have stood with us. Uh, in recent times, I think the Russian support for us in uh, uh, our relationship with China while it is less explicit, is not uh, less useful. Uh, in the sense that when the uh, defense minister went in June last year to uh, Moscow and asked um, Shoigu, spoke to the defense minister and others, and put forth a list of uh, items that we wanted expedited delivery of, uh, the Russians never said no. And as far as I understand, whatever we asked for was uh, given. Uh, similarly, I think during the visit to which uh, Ambassador Ganapati referred, during the visit of Lavrov to India, several T's were crossed and I's were dotted, which again, I agree with Ambassador Ganapati, maybe our analysts in the press tend to ignore. <coughs> One is that the Russians did reconfirm that they are with India internationally as far as the Kashmir problem is concerned. That Kashmir is an internal problem of India's and the Indians can rely on Russia to continue supporting them as they have always done. The second was an understanding that the Russians conveyed, which was given to, uh, incidentally given to uh, the Indian side earlier in 2020 itself, that there would be no arms supplies to Pakistan that would have any kind of significant strategic importance 
or in any way change the equilibrium that exists between Pakistan and India. And it is a reflection of that, that when Lavrov goes to Pakistan, if you read the joint statement they issued carefully, you will find that it says that Russia will offer specialized military equipment. In other words, that's very clear that the Russians are saying there is specific type of military equipment which can be used for counter-terrorism and maybe some helicopters that will be offered. But I don't think we are going to see what some in the press have been writing about fighter jets, submarines and all that coming into uh, uh, Pakistan from Russia. The second thing is that I think we need to understand is something else. The Russians are very cold-blooded calculators of international politics. And they understand that they have been a great power. So they understand they have this institutional ability to analyze situations. They understand fully that Pakistan doesn't have the financial wherewithal to pay for arms. I mean, at best, there could be limited arms purchases. But how can you compare with India, which purchases a minimum of at least a couple of billion a year just to service legacy purchases, if nothing else? You know, so I don't think the Russians are likely to uh, forego that with us. There are other differences uh, which may be appearing on the firmament of Russia-India relations, primarily uh, maybe some are developing over uh, Afghanistan. There could be some tensions because of the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. But let's be very clear about another thing vis-a-vis -vis the Quad. I've read a lot written by all of us, I mean, all kinds of people. But you see, one thing in India, I think we should understand very clearly. I, I know it is going to hurt some people, but look, India is not the driving force in the Quad. And the Russians understand that. There are three allies, treaty allies of the, uh, I mean, two treaty allies of the United States in the Quad. So there are three people who are tied with treaties. And India is the only outlier in that sense. So it is not India that can be the driving force of the Quad. And so whatever uh, statements the Russians make, I think they're insensitive. That's my personal view. I think the Russians could, I mean, particularly Mr. Lavrov, could uh, keep it to himself a little bit. But nevertheless, the point is when these statements are made, I think they are driven by Russian angst about the United States. And of course, there is a deeper worry vis-a-vis -vis India. And that is that India may, may, accede to uh, militarizing and securitizing the Quad in a far deeper fashion than envisaged currently. In which case, that could damage the relationship with Russia. In the final analysis, I think the Russian perspective of India-Russian relations is that India provides Russia with a certain amount of strategic space, a relationship with India provides Russia with a certain amount of strategic space vis-a-vis -vis other great powers. I would imagine the same applies to India. But we are going through some fundamental changes in the way we see the world, in the way we see ourselves. So at this point of time, I think uh, we have uh, a bit more of analysis to do about ourselves. But at the same time, I don't think we need to react with injured innocence with all kinds of statements that the Russians make in public at times. With that, I'll wind up and I'll open to questions. Thank you, sir. Questions are posted in the chat box for you. I'll take one by one. The first question, am I audible? Uh, Mr. Nandan, sir, you're muted. Yeah, yeah I'm muted. But OK. Uh, first question is, uh, they have asked about Moscow's ties with China are growing, and New Delhi ties are also getting closer with the US, Washington. And India and Russia have recently announced a 2 plus 2 dialogue between their foreign and defense ministry. Do you see this to be a setback to China's diplomacy? And uh, will this show an impact on Quad? 
Well, you know, uh, all I will say, I'll, I'll try and keep my answers short so that we can accommodate more questions. One is China and Russia have, have a two plus two much before we have announced it. We have only announced it. Uh, they have an operational two plus two. So I don't think that they are going to see this as a setback. But the fact is that if China can contribute to making the distance between Russia and India grow, the Chinese will pursue that policy. It is in their interest. And it is in our interest to protect our relationship with Russia at this point of time. So I think the Russians understand it. I think New Delhi understands it. And therefore, our relationship, I don't think at this point, is yet going to be decided by third parties. There's a question by uh, Komodo Vasan. He has asked, the interest of Russia to consider arms supply is driven by the desire to sustain its military industrial complex. As India diversifies more and more, the share of Russian supply will keep coming down. How will India work on this challenge of the possibility of sophisticated arms supply to Pakistan? Well, you know, Commodore, the point is, I agree with you on it coming down. I mean, that is a given. I think the Russians are also aware of it. So because of that, they are trying to do two things. One is they are trying to diversify the relationship to include areas which are beyond traditional arms sales. Uh, so they're mo moving into nuclear energy. They are also looking at joint development, whether it is building ships, whether it is development of um, missile systems. So they are trying to, I mean, both sides, I'm not talking of Russians alone. Both sides are trying to see if we can qualitatively change the relationship in a manner where it is not dependent purely on purchase of arms. The second aspect vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, I again, I'll repeat what I said. Unless Pakistan gets itself onto an economically strong footing, I don't think any serious arms sales are going to take place to Pakistan from Russia. Again, this is a question by Komodo Vasan. He has asked, will China bite for time to reclaim Vladivostok, though as far as the Russians are concerned, it is a non-issue. Knowing China, what are the chances that China will again bring this to the table? Well, as far as the Russians are concerned, they're very clear. I've asked this question of Russian officials. And uh, the answer I've got is very simple. The Russians and the Chinese have negotiated their border and they have clearly declared in their uh, treaty that they do not have any territorial claims on each other. And the Chinese have signed under this. The second aspect is, you know, there is a bit of a myth about this great demographic shift that is taking place in the Russian Far East with these 300, 400, 500,000 Chinese who are going and settling there. That I think is a myth that we need to be disabused of for the simple reason that the Russian Far East is not a very attractive place. Uh, it doesn't have too many resources. <clears throat> it does have some. It is a, a inhospitable climate. And uh, the earnings and living standards on the Chinese side of the border are vastly, are vastly superior. The second point is, if you look at the migration patterns of the northern areas of China, you will find that a much larger number of people are moving from those provinces south in search of jobs than any going across the border to Russia to look for economic sustenance. So therefore, in my opinion, uh, I don't think right now, or at least for the next two decades, I don't think the Chinese are going to raise any territorial claims on China. Today, due to economic reasons, Russia needs China more than China needs Russia. How is Russia tackling this issue? Well, you know, uh, as I said, the Russians understand that and they uh, clearly don't want their economic dependence to uh, affect their political independence. Uh, they have a systemic kind of... Uh, some checks and balances in play. But yes, unless uh, the Russian economy 
collapses dramatically, uh, which there don't seem to be any signs of that. I don't see the dependence increasing greatly. But uh, if, yes, if the Russian economy, uh, for some peculiar reason, or for some external reasons, uh, or even internal for that matter, uh, does uh, implode, then uh, then all bets are off. I mean, we are going to see a completely new situation. We have started getting the uh, Sputnik vaccine as part of the vaccination drive. China has not been able to garner a big share of the vaccine economy except for some African and other developing countries. How do you see Chinese responses at losing out on this opportunity? Will they join hands with Russia? How would Russia respond? Well, they have already joined there in the sense that there are talks about uh, the Chinese uh, uh, and Russians joining hands to produce Sputnik. Uh, I am not very certain about the uh, developments with the vaccines, but if I'm not mistaken, one of the Chinese vaccines is recognized by the WHO, right? So therefore, uh, the Chinese do have the capability to export, and uh, it all depends on availability of vaccines. I mean, if China has excess vaccines, they will export them. If they do not, then obviously uh, it will hamper their uh, efforts at vaccine diplomacy. You can see that this is the same that happened with us. We were keen to export initially, and we made uh, entered into multiple agreements, particularly with our neighbors. But now, because of the crisis in India, uh, uh, we have to, we've had to renege on those uh, agreements. There's a deep-rooted mutual trust deficit between Russia and China historically. Does the current economic and strategic synergy address that at some level? Undoubtedly, I do, do, don't have a doubt about it. You know, this uh, <clears throat> concept of trust I mean, it, it, it requires a long period of time for it to develop, that I agree. But uh, I would imagine that uh, if a country decides that it is able to share uh, a ballistic warning missile uh, system technology with another country, that there is already a certain element of trust that's developed. Uh, let's be also very clear about something else that the Russians had offered this to us way back in 2000s. It was offered to us by uh, uh, the Russians. It was uh, offered to Jaswan Singh, then foreign minister. But we dilly-dallied. So we are talking of 2002, 2003. Uh, the Russians uh, offered it to us. The Chinese have taken advantage. What is the future of Russia-China ties post Putin era? Hmm. That, I must say, is a very good question. Uh, it is genuinely a very good question because, uh, you know, post Putin or post Xi, uh, a lot of things may change internally in either of the two countries. So a lot will depend on what happens. If, if for example, the Putin regime breaks down and is replaced by a far more liberal uh, dispensation, then obviously you're going to see significant change in the relationship of Russia has with the West, as well as, and uh, correspondingly, with China. Uh, Xi Jinping's departure also, we don't know how uh, it is going to impact the internal politics in China. So they, you know, these are, uh, these are, you know, what, what I would suggest belong to the realm of astrology. It is very, very difficult at this time, for me at least, to predict these things. Thank you, sir. There's a question they have asked. In the long term, in your view, uh, which one would you see would survive, either the BRICS or the Quad? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I firstly don't see them as enemies of each other. Uh, it all depends 
on how well and how nimble footed India is. If we are very nimble and agile and protect our interests carefully, I think both will survive. But uh, because at this point of time, um, it is important that we maintain relationships with an entire gamut of great powers and keep our channels of communication open. Please remember one thing that, you know, uh, there has been, I mean, in quotes, regime change in the United States, uh, but we yet don't know what the end result of that regime change is going to be. You know, are they going to be liberal interventionists? Are they going to be isolationists? What are the tendencies that are going to win within the United States? After all, the United States has a huge number of internal problems, which are going to be Biden's primary focus. He has to deal with those. How much time are they going to have for external issues? So until all these issues resolve and settle, and let's have no doubt again, the United States today is the preeminent uh, power in the world uh, so far. And therefore, the way they resolve the issues that are taking place within their country is going to have huge impact on the rest of the world. Can India leverage its soft power to wean Russia, uh, Russia away from China? Look, the Russians are pragmatic believers in the balance of power theory. They believe in hard power. Soft power is good, but it means nothing without substantial hard power. So they are, let me be very clear about this, they are quite disappointed with India in many ways because they had put many eggs in the Indian basket hoping that India would develop its economic, military and other capabilities to a far larger degree than it has done so far. They had bet on India in the year 2000, but uh, uh, that has not happened. Can we compensate for our lack of hard capacity with soft power? I very seriously doubt that. How significant is the Russian characteristic as a nation in determining a quasi security cooperation between Russia and China? I am afraid I don't understand the question. Uh, he has asked how important, like, would there be any kind of a quasi security cooperation between uh, China and Russia uh, in terms of a, a typical Russian characteristics? No, no, I understand that. Uh, uh, there is already uh, a quasi security cooperation. I mean, there's full fledged security cooperation. The question we are discussing is will they have clauses? Will they sign a treaty? which says that if one is attacked, the other will necessarily have to move to the defense of that party. You know, like we used to have in the Indo-Soviet Treaty, although it was worded very nicely that we would consult each other and protect the security interests of each other and all. Incidentally, the Russians and Chinese, there is such a clause in their 2001 treaty, right? But clearly it is not as firm as let's say the NATO Article 5, right? Now, will they move that? Will they move it to a very formal uh, treaty level kind of relationship? I don't think so. I don't think Russia is interested. I also don't think China is interested because despite the current hostilities with the United States, let's be very clear, their economic engagement with the United States is humongous. It dwarfs their relationship with anyone else. So they, they are not likely to uh, unnecessarily try and bring irritants into their relationship with the United States. Unless the United States moves decisively against the Chinese interests, uh, then of course, all bets are off. I mean, you could have anything develop. Uh, the next question is on how does Russia view a multipolar world? Russia wants a multipolar world uh, because in a multipolar world, just as we do, 
because we feel that we will have greater strategic space to maneuver if there are multiple powers there and you know you will have coalitions of powers in particular areas of interest and coalitions of different kind in different areas so that will give great powers greater amount of maneuver i don't mean great powers in the sense like the united states or china but let's call them middle powers you know the middle powers will have greater maneuverability uh so therefore i would think just by i mean the emergence of a bipolarity between china and usa should be a nightmare for both india and uh, russia russia china cooperation in space is at all time high today your views on this please and isn't it russia giving away too much to china you know the the, the problem is what, what what is this definition of too much russia was a leading space power when the soviet union existed it was competing in every sense of the word with the united states there was a brief period before uh you had the private sector engage emerge in the us uh, space sector where the russians were the only ones who had heavy lift rockets to take uh people to the space station and international space station and all however the russians lacked funding and were not able to move other programs which they had today the chinese have that wherewithal the russians are keen to develop further and they want to enter into an engagement now i'm just i'm not saying that we should but suppose we had the wherewithal they would be keen to do it with us so it's a question of what are russian national interests and russia will pursue its national interest we can't expect russia to pursue our national interest we have to pursue our own national interest the point is to keep talking to the russians and see where our national interests coincide or where we are on the same page and try and develop those areas there are bound to be as with any great powers any middle level powers areas in which russia and india differ and there will be areas in which china and russia differ so i don't think that a close relationship between russia and china is the end of the world for us right so uh, but we need to develop our capabilities make ourselves more attractive as a partner in cooperation to everybody else thank you sir there are three questions clubbed into one the first part is how far india russia relation relationship has been transformed from a buyer seller to one of strategic cooperation and joint partner uh, can i take it in one go or you want to take it one by one no no we'll take it in one go yeah and second is could you throw some light on india russia cooperation in energy sectors like siberia and far east and arctic energy sector and the third is how would you see the feasibility of reviving vladivostok chennai maritime corridor in association with japan okay you know uh, this buyer seller relationship has really become a mm, you know it's become a stone round our neck if you want in the sense that both sides uh are keen to develop it but the really really the only success that we've had so far is the brahmos uh there are some uh projects now on the anvil uh i mean like the russians are going to help us build the frigates and all so hopefully uh mm, they fructify and this relationship further develops uh, i am also hoping that we move away from getting merely production technologies into getting design and technical capabilities also so that is as far as the uh, buyer seller relationship is concerned uh, i think both sides are engaged with the matter but there are still there is still a long way to go uh, and on the other hand the positive part is that i think we are so far ahead with the russian so far that the russians feel that even if we diversify and open such relations with other parties like whether it is the french or the americans or anyone they have a long way to catch up that is one energy we have uh, invested in many areas 
uh, in Russia. Uh, we are developing, but you see, we we can at best bring money. Uh, we are not really a technological powerhouse in the uh, exploration for hydrocarbons. And we particularly don't have much knowledge about how this is to be done in the Arctic, for example. But we are learning, we are making an attempt, and we are getting into arrangements for LNG and others with the Russians. But this is, again, as I said, is going to be a, a, a long haul. But we are definitely a partner Russia will consider, because as I said, Russia does not want to be entirely dependent on the Chinese, particularly in the hydrocarbon sector. So if India is engaged in it, they will only welcome it. The question is, what is the form and how do we want to get engaged? Chennai Vlajivastok, yes, absolutely. I have to let you into a secret that ORF runs a trilateral, has just started in fact, started on the 17th of May. We have started a trilateral of Japan, Russia and India. And uh, we are meeting again on the 27th, where we are going to be discussing precisely this question of uh, Russia, Japan and India cooperating. One of the areas is uh, the Russian Far East. The other is the issue of uh, the Chennai Vladivostok corridor and whether any other connectivity projects are there where the three of us could collaborate. Right now, I will say that I think the potential exists. There is a great amount of potential. Uh, but uh, uh, how we take it uh, to fruition is a difficult question because we have to keep in mind the fact that Japan is a treaty ally of the United States. The United States has a very strict uh, sanctions regime in place against Russia. So Japan cannot be seen to openly violating that. Japan, in fact, has joined the sanction regime very reluctantly and implements it very loosely. But the fact of the matter is that it cannot be openly defiant of it. When the sanctions were present on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, companies were forbidden to make investments over 1 billion US dollars in the Russian energy sector. The waiving of sanctions paved the way for Chinese investments in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. As Chinese banks had already been contracted for the project as per the reports in the media. You know, I, I don't uh, think the Russians would like the Chinese to be involved in Nord Stream 2. Uh, they may be seeking Chinese money, that there is uh, a possibility. Uh, but I don't think that the Chinese would have any kind of equity or other kind of participation in Nord Stream 2. The second aspect is that the waiver of Nord Stream 2 by Biden was taken because he needs to distinctly improve his relationship with the European countries. There is a drive to improve the relationship with allies, which for a variety of reasons deteriorated during Trump's uh, 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 stay in power. Uh, whether in the long run, this will lead to easing the sanctions regime on Russia itself, I have a serious doubt. I think that Russia-US relations right now are uh, sort of deep, very, very low. And they're going to remain there for some more time until some structural uh, differences and contradictions between them are resolved. And unfortunately, to a large extent, that will also be dependent on the US relationship with China and whether the US eventually uh, decides that it may be more useful if it wants to try and contain and curtail China to have Russia on your side, even as a neutral power, not your side in the sense as a partner, but even as a neutral would probably make that task much easier. Although Russia is a great friend, Russia has been making many loaded statements on Jammu and Kashmir. How much weightage should we give to this? 
I I haven't heard a loaded statement, so I don't know how to react to this. All I know is that at the United Nations, uh, they have voted for us each and every time, uh, including uh, recently. So when uh, China took the question of Kashmir to uh, the United Nations, I know that there was some uh, confusion arose when the uh, deputy of the Russian representative to the UN made some kind of uh, statement. But I think that has been pulled back and uh, uh, the context has been explained. And the Indian side does not have any uh, doubts about where Russia stands on this question. So again, I mean, there are mischief makers all over the world. And uh, some want to create mischief. Good luck to them. Uh, the post Wuhan virus saw the formation of what? How do you see its effect on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization mechanism? Can you can you say that again? I just lost you for a second. Yeah, uh, post Wuhan virus, we have seen the uh, formalization of Quad. How do you see its effect on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization mechanism? You know, uh, uh, SCO is from an Indian perspective. Uh, is a vehicle which we find useful because it gives us the opportunity to interact more closely with our Central Asian partners. And it gives us the capacity to increase our footprint in that region. Something that we were finding difficult to do when we were not part of the formerly part of the SCO. So in that sense, there are certain benefits to the SCO uh, that India has. Secondly, now with the question situation in Afghanistan unraveling, uh, the SCO probably, or at least the countries in uh, members of the SCO, have an important role to play uh, in stabilizing the situation. So, from an Indian perspective, uh, the SCO is not a negative organization. Of course, we are not interested in converting it in, into some kind of NATO-like uh, arrangement. We are not interested in securitizing it. It already has a certain security aspect in terms of anti-terrorism. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I don't think we are looking at it. Uh, you know, but uh, how do I put this? Uh, the uh, the Wuhan, <laughs> Wuhan virus strengthened um, quad is not a one-to-one -one equation. And I don't think... Uh, the Wuhan uh, virus and SCO is also a one-to-one -one equation. I think uh, I think we have to be very clear about what is our national interest and why we pursue particular projects and uh, continue doing what we think are in is in our best interest. Thank you, sir. The last question for this session is by DJ number Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan. He has asked, to what degree might the reluctance of Russia to subscribe even to India's own concept of Indo-Pacific as a strategic geography, uh, while he is not referring to the US obsession that the Indo-Pacific is for a strategy, is a function of the reluctance of Caucasian Russia to cede political centrality to Asian Russia. That's a, a very uh, interesting question, Admiral. I uh, I will not venture into the uh, differences between the uh, intellectual and strategic community that is based in the Russian Far East and the Moscow clique. But what I would like to say is, and this is again uh, something that uh, I have heard uh, Mr. Putin say directly at that same Valdai conference where he spoke about uh, the ABM with China, he also answered a question on the Indo-Pacific. And he said exactly what our Prime Minister said in Shangri-La. He said, and this is with Lavrov sitting in the front seat, incidentally. Uh, he said that as long as it is not directed against anyone, as long as it is inclusive, he does not see any reason why Russia should not uh, accept it. However, if it is directed against anyone, 
or if it is uh, to be utilized as a vehicle of exclusion, then of course Russia is not going to welcome it. So that is for us to decide where they stand on. But there is something else I'd like to point out. You know, changing concepts in strategic thinking is not an easy process. I mean, that's my view. The Russians uh, accepted Asia Pacific when? Only when APEC and all came about. No? Again, Asia Pacific is a US construct. It is not a Russian construct. But they accepted it with reluctance because they had certain interests. The time will come if you see Russian actions. I, to me, it appears uh, self-evident that the time will come when they will accept the Indo-Pacific also. May not be verbally, explicitly, uh, so as not to upset the Chinese, uh, but uh, they will work with us in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you uh, very much, sir, for patiently taking all our questions. With this, I would like to hand over the floor to Ambassador Yam Ganapati for his concluding remarks. Over to you, Ambassador. Yeah, is it audible? Perfect, sir. Yeah, uh, Nandan, uh, thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. I think nobody could have done better with your experience of having served in Moscow, of uh, helming a lot of activities in the ORF, I think you are perhaps in the front row seat of all these activities. And uh, your exposition and also the answers to questions were clear, precise, and to the point. I think we've all benefited extensively. In fact, uh, on the last question, you should have also said uh, to Admiral Pradeep Chauhan that the question on Indo-Pacific, which Putin answered, was asked by you. I think. You were the one who raised that question to President Putin, if I'm not wrong. So obviously, I think you knew what the answer would be. Uh, and uh, you're right. I think uh, in that question, uh, in that answer, President Putin clearly says that uh, there's no problem as long as it is not directed against anybody. And of course, he does mention China there. Uh, on uh, the other point which you also referred to uh, is very interesting uh, in terms of the treaty relationship. Uh, I'm, I was quite surprised that the Article 9 of the Indo-Soviet Treaty has a same number article, Article 9 in the Russian-Chinese Treaty, uh, you know, which talks of if, there, if either of the parties face a threat, they'll get immediately uh, start consultations to take appropriate action. I don't know what is the significance of 9 in a Sino-Russian thing, even though in a Chinese context, number eight is the most significant one. So that is, again, a very, very interesting thing. The third point, which we have, I, I don't know whether any of you noticed, uh, there's a recent report which talks of uh, Russia setting up a base in Sudan. They've got uh, permission recently. So would this, in the long term, uh, set up a cooperation between Djibouti and Sudan in the long run. I think, Nandan, you raised your finger. Do you want to uh, talk about that? Then I'll continue. Yeah, I just wanted to know two things, two, two, two points. In fact, uh, I just wanted to point out that you are the person who can answer it. Because the clause 9 out of our treaty was taken out by us, if you remember, with the Russians, when we renegotiated the treaty with the Russians. That is point one. The point two is that regarding Sudan, uh, an interesting development has taken place last week where the Sudanese have suspended the agreement with the Russians pending a review. So uh, uh, the Russians are not uh, right now in Sudan. I mean, the base is uh, on hold. But the fact remains, and there I completely agree with you, that the Russians are interested in the Indian Ocean. The Russians want to be present in the Indian Ocean. And I think that is why I say that I, if not in words, but in deed, they will be supporting the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, I think uh, I agree. Uh, sorry, I missed this part about the thing going into review. Uh, but uh, what is very significant, if you recall, in 2001 itself, when Russia moved, moved its maritime doctrine on the Indian Ocean, they were very clear that they will. this will be an area of considerable interest for them. And... Uh, 
I think that is where, even if you look at the Indo-Pacific, I think uh, between what Lavrov said in Hanoi in February 2020, what he said in China in Guilin, what he talked of to the Hindustan Times, it's been nuanced change of definition. So I entirely agree with you that given the period of time, I think they will come to recognizing the significance of the Indo-Pacific as a context. And now with uh, India's act Far East and the Vladivostok Chennai coming into play and Sudan, if it comes on in the long run, I think there's no doubt that Russia will look at Indo-Pacific. The other point which I thought uh, flowing from the discussion is in terms of Russia's Russia-India military cooperation, there were many cities which survive on India's military engagement with Russia. Severodinsk for one and Irkutsk, the cities which manufacture Sioux. If, if I recall from my own interactions there with various uh, production heads, they were quite grateful to India for continuing to move this on. I also agree with you on the border part, uh, the Far East issue. I think uh, Article 4 or 5 of the Treaty of Good Neighbourliness does clearly demark mention that the border is settled and there will be no issues. Uh, the point on uh, SEO is always a debate whether India finds merit in being in the SEO. I think you put it very succinctly. I think uh, it helps us uh, interact with the Central Asian leaders to a larger extent as we would not have been able to do otherwise. And that is where I think one of the points, uh, which is also in the chat box, I think which perhaps Bala missed, was the IN, uh, TSC, Indian, uh, uh, the International North-South Transit Corridor. If you recall, when we were in Moscow, uh, the Afanasin 500th anniversary was being celebrated. And uh, I think uh, Lavrov, if I'm not wrong, or somebody else had recently also harked upon it. And we, of course, have been moving on further through the Iran to Iran, the Caspian Sea, and on to Russia. And that is where what is also significant, if, which you mentioned, the EEU and the BRI. If, most of the BRI has been moving through Central Asia and not much through, uh, through Russia. And even though uh, President Putin had talked of the, uh, what do you call the Trans-Siberian Railway recently, the Chinese have not shown much interest there. So that is another significant thing. But all in all, I think a very riveting uh, presentation, Nandan. And uh, thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, I think we now, uh, Bala, if you agree, I think we can move on to the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Ganapati, sir. And thank you, Mr. Nandan Unikrishnan, sir, for taking time out to be with us. On this note, I would like to invite my colleague, Ms. Nisha, to present the, formally present the vote of thanks. Over to you, Nisha. Thank you, sir. We have come to the conclusion of another insightful C3S NMF institutional dialogue. On behalf of Team C3S, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and appreciate the valuable contributions of all those who played an important part in the success of today's event. First and foremost, I would like to place on record our heartfelt gratitude to our speaker for the day, Mr. Nandan Onikrishnan, Distinguished Fellow, Observer Research Foundation. Sir, you have brought a lucid clarity to our understanding of this important partnership between India and Russia and have certainly added a profound dimension to the evolving notions and arguments concerning China's influence on Indo-Russian relations. We thank you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today, and we look forward to having you talk to us again. Our sincere thanks to the moderator for today, Ambassador M. Ganapati, former Secretary West, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, Thank you, sir, for setting the tone for today's proceedings and for contextualizing this discussion. We have certainly garnered va valuable insights from the perspectives you provided, and we look forward to having you with us again tomorrow, sir. I would also like to express our gratitude to Commodore R.S. Vasan, Indian Navy retired and director C3S. Sir, we are deeply indebted to the direction support and course correction that you provide to us at the helm of Team C3S. It has enabled us to rise 
a rise to your standards in creating platforms for critical dialogues and discussions on some of the most pressing issues of our time. The members of C3S play a truly indispensable role in contributing strategic insights and opinions, raising critical questions and engaging in, in informative deliberations on China with a focus on matters pertaining to India. We thank you for your continued support towards steadily improving and diversifying our research profile. This institutional dialogue would not have been complete without the presence of such an engaged audience. Sincere thanks to all our participants, esteemed dignitaries and guests, valued readership and supporters, dynamic research scholars and interns. We deeply appreciate your active participation and all the important questions you have raised. We hope to see you all again tomorrow at our book conversation on the Tiananmen Square protests with Ambassador Vijay Gokhale at 5 p.m. And, fin and finally, I warmly thank my colleagues, the members of Team C3S, Mr. Bala Subramanian and Ms. Padmashri Anandan, for their unrelenting determination and creative efforts, which have made this event possible and continue to take C3S forward. Thank you all once again, and Jai Hind. Thank you, Jai Hind.